Hello and welcome to our podcast. Uh, we are very fortunate to have John McConnell with us today and I wanted to give you just a little bit of a background about John. He has been with The Lancet for about 30 years and in 2001 he was the founding editor of The Lancet Infectious Diseases. Uh, he has been a member of the organizing committee of numerous conferences and he has appeared as an expert commentator on BBC, ITV, Channel 4, Sky News um, and many others. Uh, it's an appropriate moment to be speaking with John. Uh, welcome. Hi, hi. Nice to talk to you. And nice to talk to you too. Um, tell us before we begin with some questions around the COVID-19 crisis and uh, the link with the SDGs as you see it, uh, a little bit about the founding of Lancet Infectious Diseases. Yeah, so Lancet Infectious Diseases was the second of the specialty journals which the, the Lancet launched. Um, so we decided to to launch some specialties because we uh, the, the weekly Lancet uh, was just simply receiving um, far too many um, good papers um, in particular topics which uh, the journal has histor historically been strong in um, and we thought that um, well, there was a market there which we could serve and uh, we really didn't want to turn away um, strong research which the um, the weekly journal didn't have the capacity to publish and um, infectious diseases was um, one of those uh, particular strong points of the, of the Lancet, um, always historically had been. And about 20% of the papers that the Lancet received and still does um, are, are in infectious diseases topics. Um, so we, we really started as a um, as a publishing avenue for, for that material, which was um, unlikely to make it into the into the weekly journal but but of course in the last almost 20 years now um then the journal has um uh, established its um uh, its own place in the infectious diseases field and and we receive a a huge amount of uh, primary research sent to us uh, particularly at the moment that is um fantastic that the need for the journal um, evolved in terms of branching out from a wide uh, interest in terms of uh, academic papers. And do you think that the situation uh, that we uh, find ourselves in should have been apparent? And is there something to be said about, you know, these? this happens with with uh, some type of frequency of a given period of years, or is this more down to man-made events? Mm. Um, an awful lot of thought and planning has gone into pandemic preparedness, uh, but we were still not sufficiently resourced to uh, deal with a, um, a pandemic um, on, on this scale. Um, and you could argue, uh, when would we ever be sufficiently resourced? I mean, obvious things that we need at the moment are uh, ventilators and personal protective uh, equipment. Um, and um, if I, I do wonder uh, if they were sitting in a storage warehouse for 20 years and never used, uh, the, but then we'd get into the reverse situation of what we have now is, is people saying, why are we spending all this money on stuff we never use? Uh, but then you can make the same argument for our armed forces, I guess. Uh, and very, very few people doubt the need to have some sort of um, um, some sort of military. Um, so um, I, I think in the long term, we're going to have to look far, far more seriously um, at the uh, preparedness um, for future pandemics. And, and perhaps this is the sort of kick in the pants that, that we need to do that. Um, and I think the other big issue is, is around um, the alert system for um for knowing when when a pandemic is is coming our way uh, and and china is um one of the best prepared countries in the world uh, but still they were they were caught slightly on the hop in, in that the disease was almost cer certainly circulating in in wuhan um uh, throughout december uh, before it really began to be noticed sometime in the middle of December um, and then didn't um, uh, wasn't notified um, to the World Health Organization um, uh, until the end of December and you could make a a, a fairly um, 
sensible calculation that by, by the time the World Health Organization was notified, there, there were probably already thousands of cases um, in China spreading throughout China and, and almost certainly starting to um, spread spread throughout the world. Um, so so how do we do? How do we notify? How do we become more alert? Um, uh, the next time round, uh, and uh, and there are no easy answers. Uh, I, I'm afraid we we are uh, every time this happens, we are there's always going to be a certain element of of catching up with events. So, in terms of the link with the Sustainable Development Goals, um, the SDGs, as we know, were adopted in 2015 unanimously by all nations of the world, and they are meant to be a framework for development for both um, the wealthiest countries and um, the least wealthy. This, this situation, this crisis that the world finds itself in, um, you know, what is the connection that you see with the Sustainable Development Goals? Yeah, um, it, it's it's going to put the um, targets back, I think, un without doubt. So, so SDG three, which deals with uh, health and well-being, it, it specifically mentions um, several diseases by name. So, um, I'm probably going to miss a few here, but there's there's polio, um, TB, malaria, HIV, uh, hepatitis B, uh, and it and it talks about the ne neglected tropical diseases as well. Uh, and the target by 2030 is to is to end these as as public health concerns. Um, now we're we're already um, a little bit behind target for for most of those diseases. Although huge progress has been made, uh, particularly if you look at um, if you go back at a, a time frame, say go back to um, uh, to 1990, uh, then then vast progress has been made in in halving the impact of these diseases in in terms of of, of morbidity or mortality. Um, but I don't, I don't think we're at the moment on course to to end them as public health concerns uh, by by 2030 uh, and maybe they that, that was always too too ambitious a target anyway so uh, i mean let's just take some some really um practical examples uh, of recent experience we know for example that the ebola outbreak which happened in west africa uh, in um uh, 2014 2016 um i mean that that caused uh, many thousands of deaths but at the same time it it's almost certain uh, that malaria caused far more deaths um, so what Ebola did um, uh, is is that it, it distracted attention from malaria. Um, recently, with the Ebola outbreak in um, which is coming close to an end in DR Congo, um, that that's caused um, uh, two or three, a couple of thousand deaths. Um, uh, and um, thanks to the containment efforts, it, it didn't become more widespread. But at the same time, uh, measles. There's been a huge measles outbreak in, in DR Congo, which has received very very little publicity compared with Ebola uh, and has has killed far more children uh, that, than Ebola has uh, over the same time frame. So what COVID-19 risks doing is, is just simply diverting the world's attention and resources uh, away from the diseases which are, are part of the, um, of the sustainable development goals. And do you think that because people are not circulating the way they would normally, will we see any type of improvement in other disease? Yeah, um, that is a really good question. Um, I, I would have thought that um, with the um, with our attention focused on reducing the transmission of respiratory diseases um, and on hand hygiene, um, then there's a fairly good chance that we we will see a reduction in other things that circulate all the time, such as flu. Although for the the northern hemisphere, it's a it, it's a lower point in the flu season anyway. Um, flu, things like respiratory um, syncytial virus, which is a uh, can cause some quite severe disease in children. Um, and in other respiratory infections, um, and also um, uh, enteric infections, uh, things that cause um, diarrhea. Uh, I mean, they they they, um, they are spread by um, by the fecal oral routes. And if we're um, 
uh, having this focus on hand hygiene, then I, I think we might see a reduction in that. Um, whether that will impact something like um, which po like polio, uh, which is a, a fecal oral disease, I, I I doubt it will because the the number of cases is is still concerning, um, and it's actually slightly more this year already than at uh, the same point last year. But they they are. Uh, entirely concentrated in uh, wild type polio is entirely concentrated in Pakistan and um, Afghanistan at the moment and um, um, I'm, I'm not sure we'll have an impact on that. Uh, malaria of course is, is a disease transmitted by mosquitoes um, because people will be outdoors less. Uh, it might have an impact on that. Um, I, I would have thought that the things like um, less exposure to um, uh, to pollution to pollution might might have an impact on on chronic diseases uh, rather than on infectious diseases. So so there could well be a, a, a some sort of silver lining to this. Um, getting back to the text of SDG three, good health and well being, um, three point D is strengthen the capacity of all countries, in particular developing countries, for early warning, risk reduction, and management of national and global health risks. Mm -hmm. So, in practical terms, what measures does a country need uh, to take in order to meet that target? Yeah. Um well, there is uh, so basically they have to have the capacity to um, to meet the international health regulations. Um, so so they need to have um, they need to have a surveillance and an, uh, and an early warning system uh, in place. Uh, I mean, th there are some countries still uh, which just have absolutely no disease surveillance. Um, so if if flu were to pop up in um, parts of Africa, for example, um, we, we simply wouldn't know it was there um, until it spread across the borders into um, into a country which did have um, a, a active on, ongoing um, um, sentinel surveillance. So so this sort of strengthening capacity, um, it's about giving countries the um, the uh, the laboratory and the testing capacity um, to do their own surveillance, to be aware of the the uh, the big picture of um, disease um, infectious diseases in their countries uh, and to have the capaci capacity to um, uh, notify uh, the, the WHO. Um, and there is an ongoing program to, to strengthen um, countries' capacity to do that. Um, some of that has been led by the CDC in the United States. Uh, and unfortunately, the, um, uh, the, the budget cuts that the CDC has had to experience um, under the Trump administration have, have done absolutely nothing um, to help the, uh, the CDC in, in strengthening the, the capacity of, of other countries to, to deal with uh, pandemic situations. Um, if a country like the United States has struggled to scale up in terms of testing, and that has been something that has been cited as a beneficial factor in South Korea, what hope do countries in um, the Southern Hemisphere um, and um, in the Global South have in terms of mm. being able to deal with with this crisis. I'm um, very worried about um, their ability to um, address this at scale. Yeah, um, I, I mean that's a uh, that's a key issue, and and it and it's part of the end game issue as well. So the United States is by conventional me measures um, the the best prepared country in the world. Um, to to deal with um, uh, th this sort of uh, wide scale public health uh, crisis, but but even the United States has has struggled um, to uh, and, and perhaps because there was some measure of denial going on that it was really happening, uh, which is I think has happened to a, a greater or lesser degree um, in most countries. So yeah, it's, so it's a fair point. Is if you if the best prepared country in the world can't deal with it, how how are um, um, how are countries which have very little capacity uh, going to cope? Um, 
you could perhaps maybe argue that um, um, on on the background of the infectious diseases that they're dealing with already, um, uh, will it make such will it make such a huge impact? I, I think it, uh, uh, particularly um, in terms if you look at their age structure. Um, so so I think there's a double edged sword here. Is is that there's uh, the the countries that we're really talking about in the global south, their the a structure of their population is particularly concentrated amongst younger people, um, which which is not not which is not the case for the um, um, for the high income countries. Um, and COVID nineteen appears to have a much lesser impact amongst young people uh, than it does um, amongst older people. So perhaps we can take some some measure of reassurance there that the scale of the impact won't be so great. Um, as it is in um, in northern Italy, for example, which has a ha has an aging population. But the counter to that is that um, as we go forward and we deal with the current wave of the pandemic, um, countries which have no capacity to deal with the disease might act as, if you like, little incubators to to reintroduce um, COVID-19 in, into the rest of the world. So as we um, um, how can we put it as we uh, as we suppress the disease, um, in the, the worst affected countries of the world, then we are going to have to reach out to those with less capacity um, and and help them um, in tackling and, and suppressing. Um, or otherwise, we are we are going to see um, successive pandemic waves until until a vaccine becomes available. So so there is there is no option here um, other than international collaboration uh, and helping those countries which are which are less well resourced than we are. And I wonder if there's a public health opportunity when you look at the fact that more males seem to be contracting the the disease and um, higher rates of mortality some of that will come down to lifestyle choices for example smoking um, and drinking uh, things that might compromise um, the health mm -hmm. of males in certain populations uh, is is that a fair point? Yeah, I think that's fair. And there's also workplace mixing as well. Um, uh, work, workplace mixing is 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 definitely a source of spread. Um, and in societies where um, more men go out to work and women tend to stay at home, that 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 might be a uh, that that might be a factor in um, uh, in in making men more liable to um, uh, to to have the disease. I, I don't. I doubt women have uh, any sort of uh, innate immunity com uh, compared with men. So it, it is going to be lifestyle factors. Uh, one of the things that has struck me is the ability of the world to change um, and so quickly um, here in the United Kingdom. Uh, the oh, There was um, kind of rumblings that things would be restricted and then you know over the course of, of one week things had changed dramatically in terms of the free movement of people and and um, the advice coming from government and the shutdown of virtually most parts of the economy that are not considered to be critical. Does that give you any sense of optimism in terms of dealing with other uh, large scale challenges like climate change? <laughs> um, well, in the long term, climate change is a far greater uh, threat to human health the, than this disease is. Um, and you, you could ask um, why, if COVID-19 is a public health emergency of international concern, what, why is climate change not a public health emergency uh, of, of international concern? Um, it's the, the, the differences between a, a chronic threat which, which we have learned to live with um, and an acute uh, threat of, of which we have absolutely um, no knowledge and, and people are naturally scared um, of um, um, of um, of new threats, um, and and there's still this pervasive feeling uh, that we will somehow get away with climate change uh, without having to really change our lives. Um, the, perhaps the lesson that it is possible to change our lives um, will will sink in 
um, and there will be more willingness um, to to confront the the uh, lifestyle changes in terms of um, energy use um, and um, traveling habits and that sort of thing, uh, which are uh, essential to um, uh, to deal with um, climate change. I mean, I'll give you a very practical example. I um, where I live is 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 quite close to Heathrow Airport. Um, and um, I see air traffic um, all day, every day. Uh, and at the moment, there is barely air, any air traffic. Uh, but somehow uh, we are managing to survive. Um, do, do we really, really need to travel by airplane quite as much as we do? Um, it, it, it might plant that seed in, in people's minds um, and, and people might be more willing to, to change their lifestyles. And I, I certainly hope that's the case. So one of the issues um, in terms of the um, development of this disease is related to, at least we think, zoonotic um, transmission from animal to human. And it's a question about where that originated. But one thing is clear that there has been significant loss of uh, biodiversity through man-made activity, whether that is um, uh, logging, clearing of um, a forest or um, or other uh, encroachments of uh, modern society on habitat, it may mean that um, animals have, are under more stress in terms of their own immune systems, less able to deal with um, challenges that arise for them in terms of disease and it making it easier for human to animal transmission. Mm -hmm. First, is, is that is that true? And then if that is the case or, or do, if we suspect that, um, is this also an argument for focusing on um, biodiversity, increasing um, habitat, reforestation, um, you know, making that link as well again with climate change? Yeah, um, I, I, I think so. So the animals, let's just assume because we don't know better at the moment that this indeed did indeed start in a um, uh, in a wet market in, in Wuhan. Um, and uh, and uh, the, the dates might have been a bit earlier than than um, than we are currently thinking. Um, I mean, I suspect it's. Uh, the disease was probably circulating by by the end of November rather than early December, but but we can't be certain of that. But let's just assume that it did start in that animal market. Those animals there are, were certainly under stress. Uh, there, there's no doubt about that at all. Um, seven something like seventy percent of emerging infectious diseases in the past fifty years have originated from um, from wild animals, um, and so we are uh, putting ourselves under unnecessary uh, degree of risk uh, by continuing to, um, to take what animals from the wild um, and to um, uh, use them as, as part of the part of the human food chain. Um, whether uh, we, we, we need to give nature some space, there's absolutely no doubt about it. We need to give nature some space and we need to stop encroaching on nature. Um, the, the whole history of, of of human disease is that it 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 it, or, it, it had its origins in um, in in nature, and I mean that that's true for for tuberculosis. As soon as, as, soon as we started farming cattle, for example, um, tuberculosis probably became a human disease uh, at somewhere around about that stage. So there is an incredibly long history here, uh, and I'm I'm not sure we can ever entirely. Um, uh, pre prevent that happening, uh, but it seems to me at the very least uh, that the um, the animals um, sources of SARS, of bird flu, um, uh, which came out of wet markets in Asia, um, th there needs to be some sort of uh, limitation, some sort of regulation there, um, and those sources need to be um, need to be phased out. Given the scale and, and severity of the COVID-19 um, crisis, it's unlike anything that we can remember in terms of the, the far-reaching nature of the spread of the disease. Now, some of that, of course, will be 
down to the fact that we are far more interconnected today than we ever were previously. But is this something that we think is an aberration? It's um, it's a kind of coming back to what I was asking about in the beginning of our conversation. Is it a once in a in so many generation type disease or do we need to be expecting that more um, infectious diseases like this will occur in the future because of some of the challenges that we've discussed? Mm. The, the, the experience in living memory is is with flu. Um, and, and I think we always have to think of respiratory diseases as being a, a, a much greater risk of pandemic spread um, than um, those spread by um, through um, foodstuffs, for example, or, uh, uh, you know, those spread by, uh, spread by contact with um, bodily fluids. Um, so I, I, I mean, I never um, I was I was deeply concerned about the Ebola outbreak in West Africa and the Congo, but I I never ever saw it as a as a pandemic threat, uh, despite the the hype around it. Um, so I, it, it's respiratory diseases that we we need to pay most attention to. Um, the flu pandemic of 1918-19, I think, is a good model for what is happening now. Um, that almost certainly uh, occurred in three successive waves. Um, until there was um, population level immunity. Um, wh whether we can, and then of course there were pandemics in in 57 of, uh, and 68 of uh, of new varieties of flu. Um, you, you, a, 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 to be sort of devil's advocate here, did did we respond respond with um, less? Uh, draconian measures in 57 and 68 simply because we knew less of what was going on um, and if we had known if we had been more if the science had made us more aware um, would we have um, uh, would we have responded with the sort of measures that we are we're seeing now and I I, I, I don't know I, I simply don't know the answer to that and we don't have a, a time machine to go back and um, um, and simulate that um, I think diseases do spread more quickly because we have such an in interconnected world um, COVID-19 was almost certainly um, in the places to which Wuhan was most connected, both within China and outside China, uh, before we even knew that the, 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 the disease existed. Um, flu is different from coronavirus diseases um, in that um, it um, originates in um, and, and mixes and reassorts in um, animal reservoirs. Um, and, and there's very, there's little or no hope of ever suppressing um, su suppressing those. Although we, uh, and by contrast, I think we, we have a chance of uh, distancing ourselves more effectively from, from the emergence of um, future um, uh, co coronavirus outbreaks. The, 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 the only protection we have here is, um, is preparedness and uh, an alertness, uh, an index of suspicion um, for, for when these things um, um, start to appear. Um, I, 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 I fear uh, that by the time even within Wuhan that the COVID-19 was noticed, it was already too late to actually stop it being a pandemic. Um, and and we, we just need to have um, much, much better uh, prepared um, surveillance systems. Um, uh, the, 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 this is the this is really the, the key subject with which people who spend their lives uh, in pandemic preparedness. The, this is the issue with which they wrestle at, at which point can can we interrupt the the spread of disease to stop it spread becoming a pandemic? Uh, and there is simply no easy answer to that question. John, I would like to thank you so much for your time today. This has been really fascinating and uh, we'll look forward to staying in touch with you. Well, thank you. Um, yeah, a, a, um, a, a pleasure to uh, to contribute and, and, and please um, stay safe, everybody out there. And if you're told to stay at home, stay at home and, um, and wash your hands. Thank you. Bye.